in this video, I will give you everything I learned in my exchange semester, like I would sitting down with a friend. Everything structured so it is easy to understand. Because I want you to also have a great time in your exchange semester, because I sure did. And to make it easier for you to get the best use out of this video, I put timestamps everywhere. So each time when you come back, you can just jump in the part you really need right now. Even though you're watching this video right now, you might still find yourself not really sure whether or not you should do an exchange semester as a design student. I just came back from my design exchange to Taiwan and it was not only one of the best times in my life, but also had so much impact on me as a designer and personally. Probably so much that I can't grasp it until later. Not only were there so many things to overcome, the language was different, everything in daily life was different, the people, the culture, everything was different. So the most simple everyday tasks we Became much more challenging. But exactly that is one of the most exciting parts of it because you have so much opportunity to grow as a person and grow with all of those challenges. I hope I at least did a little bit. I also was able to meet so many amazing people from all over Europe and Asia and even America. And beforehand, I was always asking myself how all of my friends were constantly traveling somewhere and meeting their friends there. And now I know because on those exchange studies, you meet a lot of new friends from all over the world and grow with them. And I can only imagine that if you are used to this kind of international environment, it will make it much easier to later on work with people from different cultures in a very similar environment, the one a lot of us will end up working in, especially in design. We definitely have to be open-minded because all of us are like adults at this point and for about what two decades for us we've been taught certain things but when you go to a different country where people see things very differently and so on it's very important that you have to be open-minded because sometimes it's very easy like you see a different cultural something it could be very common it's like food it might be something that might gross us out but it's important that we still have a level of respect to what we are seeing and what we are noticing because when you're in a foreign country it's important that you respect what they are doing and everything that's going on. And those are the kind of things that even non-design students can get a lot from. But what is especially exciting for us as design students is all the impressions, things, experiences we can soak in. Because at least I feel like designers are a little bit like sponges and that you get a lot of things in there and then squeeze them out as soon as you are working on a project, for example, and want to input things there. And the more different experiences and things we saw, the more interesting or out there our ideation can be. And sometimes the things I learned or saw for example, in Taiwan, might be relevant in my job, let's say, 10 years from now in Germany. Like for example, the elderly in parks in Taiwan meeting up at like 4 a.m. and exercising together. There's exercise equipment in the parks for them and it keeps the elderly so much more healthy. Really made me think about the elderly in Germany or how convenience stores are everywhere and how they work there and that we have nothing even comparable in Germany. Knowing about all those things, you can create much richer designs and experiences. But also learning about those cultural differences can really help working in a global economy. Things like the failure of IKEA in Japan, for example, because they prefer a much different aesthetic, more Japanese, let's say, and have less space available. All with the launch of Barbie in China, where there was not this established brand and the launch really failed. Those are the kind of things you will hopefully prevent then and don't have that kind of mess on your hands. There are so many reasons to do it, but you are still watching, so you are probably still on board. So when should you do it? Many degrees have a fixed period for when to do the exchange semester. The users then just skip this part. In ours, we didn't, so I had to come up myself with when to do it. Maybe you are in the same situation. First, I don't know if it is a good idea to do it in the first two semesters. Because in the first semesters, you are still focusing on learning the basics and the craft. And going for exchange in that time is maybe not that good of an idea. I think you will later on also see what other reasons might be against that. Way too often I also hear the story of people not getting credits for the exchange semester because something is not working out well. So it might be a good idea to do your exchange semester when you don't need those credits anymore. So close before the end of your studies. Just a thing to think about. It's a really big personal decision, but I think there's two options which are the best for most people. One, in the middle of your semester, let's say third semester or something like that, to be inspired and get a lot from it for the rest of your time or shortly before your degree ends as a maybe easier option that will also help you to get inspired for your final thesis. 
But where should you even go and how do you decide? Depending on your university, the possibilities luckily are not completely endless. Because how it usually works is that you can only exchange to partner universities. But you might also have the option to exchange to universities which are not part of your partner program. Now that is a little bit problematic. Because what the partner program pretty much is, is just an agreement between the universities that exchange will and can happen, that the exchange of credits in between them works, at least usually, and those kind of things. So if you want to go to a design school which is not part of your partner universities, you either can't do it, or really have to put in a lot of work together with your international office to create a partnership between the universities. And you might be able to work something out, but only if you have enough time really. And even then, because it's so much work, your university might not be able to do it or have the capacity for it. I took the normal route and just looked through my university's website with all of the partner universities listed out. If I remember correctly, I just clicked on all of them, opened them up in separate tabs and started looking at their website. And obviously, in this process, I also had my preferences. First looking at countries and universities I knew about. And I think actually the university and the country are two different things which might be of different importance to people. Because most people do an exchange for the country, not the university. But for others, it might be the university, not the country. In the best case, both, I guess. So I basically just clicked through the university websites and closed each one I didn't like and put the ones I liked on a list. Then I looked at them a little bit more, looked at their Instagram or other social media, and out of that selection, on our university website, looked at the reports of people that went there. When trying to learn a little bit more about the university, that can help a lot. Because even if you find students from that university and talk to them over, let's say, Instagram, they can only tell you how it is as a student, probably from that country, instead of a exchange student from your university. And a lot of the time, that is a much different story. So definitely read those reports, and if possible, ask your international office if you can talk to the people that went there. Maybe they are not at your school anymore. But maybe they are. And being able to ask them questions is so super helpful. In my case, I sadly could not do that. Because of the pandemic, there was a long entry ban for people coming into Taiwan. So everyone that went there had already left the university. Which is just one of the many reasons I did my video on the topic. Because even when I leave my university, I want people to get to know as much as possible about this. How to apply might be a little bit different from my university to yours. At my university, we have basically spots to apply to for every part of the university. What that means is if you want to go to a very popular exchange university, you might have to get that spot very quickly. Or else a classmate or something will take it. So I can only recommend applying two semesters before you want to go there, which is quite early, especially if you want to go in the third semester, let's say. So by that logic, you had to apply, let's say, in the first semester. But it makes sense. You reserve that spot and then wait about one semester before you would go there then your international office comes back to you asking if you want to still go there and if so you do the official application process doing a lot of administration with your partner university even though it is different basically every single time for example when applying to a university in sweden i had to go through a lot of government websites but for a different university if i remember correctly it was much easier just sending them a couple of pdfs because we're design students, a lot of the time you have to send in a portfolio. I imagine basically every time. So start working on it and collecting things to put in there. That is also a reason to maybe do it a little bit later in your studies. Because in the beginning you don't have that much to show. For some universities, that is it. For some other universities, especially the more popular ones, you might have to do a additional test or something. And now something you might have been asking yourself the entire time. How do you pay for it all? That was also a big concern for me. And it only really got better when my head of international office told me about all the kinds of sponsorships there are. I would say there's basically two kinds. One of them is a little bit more general. In Europe, for example, there is Erasmus which is basically trying to promote exchange between universities inside of Europe. But there's loads of different ones, each one with their own agenda. For example, promoting exchange from Asia to 
Europe or something like that. Or of your home country. Most of them will give you a monthly sum of money to spend and also money to cover your travel expenses. But there's also a second variant I didn't know about before, which is the university stipends. By the university you want to go to itself. Because for example in my university, the one I exchanged to, NCKU in Taiwan, there was also a program to encourage that kind of exchange. And what students had to do in return was to take particular classes and also present and promote their time in some kind of media. I totally missed out on it because I didn't know about it before. So when looking into your exchange university, try to figure out if they have something like that. So you don't miss out on it just like I did. Now let's say the confirmation comes in and you can go there. First off, congratulations on that. But there's also so much to do now. But most things your international office and the one of the exchange university can help you with. For example, finding accommodation. There's probably the option to get a dorm room. And if you don't want to go into a dorm, you can probably also rent an apartment or get a shared flat. A lot of the time, the international office of your exchange university can also help you with that. At least from what I've heard so far. But most of the time, the dorm rooms are much cheaper and closer to the university. And a lot of the time, it is much harder to get some other kind of apartment. So I really recommend to give the dorm room a try. But for example, at NCKU, everyone had a dorm room with two people in it. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, I can totally understand. But living in that dorm together with most of my friends was one of the best parts of being in Taiwan. So also with that one, I can just suggest you giving it a try. Then it might also be to book your flight and get your visa, renting out your place at home and so much more. Also, depending on where you want to go, I can really recommend you to get a good travel credit card because it could save you so much money and also hassle when trying to book a hotel or a car, for example. And why I recommend to do it as quickly as possible. In my case, for example, the ones I was interested in went such high demand that it took so long for them to arrive. So just keep those kind of things in mind and keep track of what you personally need. And imagine now, it is so short before your flight starts. Everything is so exciting and daunting. But there are some things you should take care of to not worry about it later. Because for example, depending on where you go, you won't see your loved ones in quite a long time. Spend some time with them and have some kind of event before you go. I know that for me it really helped to see them all again before leaving to not get that homesick when going there. Pack and get everything you need. Like for example power adapters for the country you are traveling to. So for example in Taiwan, protein powder was basically double the price of Germany. So I know some people that actually brought it from Germany to Taiwan. Or German tissues, which a friend of mine dearly missed and thought he should brought so much more of them. But that also goes with data. Because for example, if you don't have everything you need on a hard drive or on your laptop with you, you might not be able to get access to it for the next six months. So have everything like important documents or for example, other files of projects. For example, let's say you want to apply for an internship right after your exchange semester and you need to prepare a portfolio. Those are the kind of cases that seem weird, but in the case you didn't bring your stuff, it really sucks. But how do you even know about those things like the protein powder? There's basically no way to know those things other than talking to people. And that is one of the most important things. Because I can really just recommend you to meet people that will be there right before you go there. Because in my case I didn't, and that is not entirely true. But I didn't really know exchange students that would come there. Just students at the university. And I did some stuff with them, but in the first couple of days I felt really lonely there. Until, by accident, I met a big group of other exchange students that lived in my dorm and we started hanging out. And it turns out, there was a big chat group with more than 100 people in there. And together with them, it was the best time ever there. And what fascinated me was that most people that came there already were in the group before coming there. Because they got into it through some kind of weird Facebook group. And for everyone that was in the group, it was not only more fun to be there, but also much easier. Especially in the first couple of days with a lot of administration and questions. Because a lot of other people in the same situation were maybe, let's say, one step ahead of you and could just tell you the answer. So try to figure out if there is something similar. And if there's not, consider even starting that kind of thing. And telling your exchange university about it to add other people into it, for example. Because I really wish there's something very similar to that for you there. 
I didn't really have that much experience with traveling and still don't. So to be honest, I was pretty clueless about the flight there and what best to do. And I watched a lot of YouTube videos like you do, but yeah. The whole flight and journey to Taiwan to my university was super nerve-wracking for me. Much more than it should have been, to be honest. But just in case you are a total travel noob, just as I am, <sighs> for your flight, put all of your electronics and important stuff in your carry-on. I know it is the most obvious thing ever, but now on my flight back, my bag got lost. And you have no idea how thankful I am that my laptop and the camera I'm filming on right now is still there. For me, it was also very nice to have all of my flight information printed out. So even if my phone died, I would still know where to go and what to do. But really, I was just way too nervous about all of this because it was my first time for myself flying and then so far away. There's one thing I will probably repeat in this video a whole lot and is that things will happen bad things will happen and life will go on. And the things you fear a lot of the time are just not as bad as you thought before. It is such a cliche, but most problems we make ourselves in our mind. And now for right after the landing. In my case, it was all a little bit different because in Taiwan during that time, everything was still in quite strict COVID regulations and we had to go in a very, very strict quarantine. So basically arriving at the airport, we went through a lot of different stations, right into a testing station, right into a taxi, right into the super expensive quarantine hotel we had to book ourselves. And there we had to spend quite a long time. But things are now quite different in Taiwan and I really hope that in the future, those kind of things won't happen to you. So you will probably just arrive with your flight close to the location you want to go to. If it is at all possible, and if you know some people in the city already, maybe ask someone to meet up there. This might come in especially handy if you don't know the language of the country. And they can just help you to go to the dorm and do the check-in, for example. And those fellow exchange students can help you to get settled in. And that is exactly how you should spend your first days or even the first week. Try to settle in, put up your tent, Meet people, explore the area around you, spend amazing times with people and don't get homesick. For me, the first few weeks were some of the best memories because none of us really had any commitments yet. The university didn't really start and we were just exploring Taiwan, traveling, hanging out, partying. It was a great time. But obviously you also have to take care of university things. And in the beginning, you probably have to do a lot of application and administration work and do those things, but don't take them too hard on yourself. And if possible, do them together with all of your newfound friends because it will be just that much easier doing it with them. And just know that because you are an exchange student, you have much different circumstances than all the normal students there. And you shouldn't try to use that too much, but there is basically a free pass for a lot of things. Because you're almost like a child in this environment, you don't really know the rules, you can't really read them a lot of the time as well. And you have training wheels on. So don't try to do anything maliciously. Just know that if you mess up, a lot of the time it is not as bad as you think. Because a lot of people will just understand. By the way, if this video helped you so far, give the like button a boop, so it can also reach other people to help them. Thank you very much and let's go on. But now that you got finally settled in there, you may be asking yourself what to do and what to focus on. And I have just some recommendations just from my experience. I feel like, especially in design universities, as design students, we are focusing a lot of time on university work because most of the time it's also so much fun and we do it willingly. And that is exactly what I did in my home university. But it's a little bit different when going abroad at least in my opinion. Because even though maybe that university is amazing and you have great courses, if you don't think those courses will be the most amazing thing ever or don't realize that while being there, don't focus or don't try to focus too much time on it. Because at least in my opinion, it is far more important to spend as much good time with the friends there, with exploring the country or the city you are in and immersing yourself in that culture. Focusing on university, 
you can also have at home. I, for myself, try to focus as much as possible on doing that, but also realized that the courses I took there were quite amazing and something I couldn't have in my home university. So I also focused a lot on them while trying to keep a good balance. But really, just try to find that kind of balance for yourself and it will be a much better experience that way. Like I said, one of the biggest things is also just to explore the country. Because maybe you are in a neighboring country, but maybe you are not. Like for example, in my case, in Taiwan. And even though I definitely want to return there, I don't know when that will be. And it would have been such a waste to not really explore the country and see what it has to offer. I mean, I imagine that is one of the biggest reasons USA exchange student even wanted to go to a different country instead of studying at the home university. In our group, we had a lot of big travel on the weekends. We have a lot of people coming together and trying to go somewhere. Maybe a notable location or doing a city trip, booking a Airbnb somewhere and just staying there for a while. But a couple of my friends even brought that to entirely new levels because they didn't have that many classes during the week. So they were basically able to travel the entire week except, let's say, a couple of days where they had to go to university. But all the other time, they spent just exploring the country, roaming around, going to nature parks and cities, exploring things and basically working down a list. And when exploring the country, I can recommend to you to not just go to all the touristy places, except when you really like that kind of stuff. But I really don't. And we just got a lot of recommendations from friends and people that live there where to go. And also if you have that kind of group, you can just ask around and people can share which kind of locations make sense or were amazing to them. And you can also go there. But especially with city trips, it can be so nice to just go to a city and then see what happens. You book a place and then just start exploring and things will happen and you will find things. Like for example, when a couple of friends and I wanted to hunt for ghosts in Taishung. But then we ended up somewhere else. Really, the exploring part is just one of the best and so much fun. Related to this, even when you really like to just travel on your own, try to spend as much time as possible with your friends. Even if you have, let's say, a lot of classwork, just try to squeeze that in. Of course, being able to eat out in Taiwan made it much easier for us to have that regular thing in our friend group going. But I think the university cafeteria will be staple in pretty much every exchange university. And if not, you should be able to meet your friends every now and then after classes, just going out for a beer or hanging out in your dorm. Try to do that because you will meet amazing people, super interesting people that you would have not met otherwise. And this time together with them is just so special. I treasured it a lot and I will never forget you guys. And even though I hope to meet everyone soon again, that is not really a given. And we don't really know when it will happen. We don't know if it will happen at all. After this exchange semester, people are going away to their home countries or somewhere else. And especially if it is not a neighboring country or close to you, or you are planning to go there for, let's say, your next study or holiday, it might take quite a long while to see them again. So treasure the time you have with them right now. And if you do that, it will just create the most awesome memories. I used to watch this channel called Yes Theory quite a lot a long time ago and now they just blew up and so big. But I really just like that concept of embracing uncomfort and saying yes to things. Because if you say yes to things, things will happen just eventually. If a friend wants to go to some kind of bar or art gallery or just a weird trip at night, maybe if you say yes now, a new amazing memory will be created. And of course, sometimes those things will not be possible. And that is okay and you shouldn't worry too much about that and drive yourself mad because you couldn't attend to this or that. And if you really can't do it because you have, let's say, a deadline tomorrow, you can't, that is okay. But if it is literally not impossible, just try your best to do it and try to say as many yeses as possible because amazing things will happen. On that note, it became a little bit of a meme in our group, but we basically just said that this is a memory. If something bad happened or something uncomfortable. For example, one time when pretty much all of our friends were leaving, one of our friends would leave quite soon and we were not able to properly say goodbye to her. It was late at night in Taipei and it was raining quite a lot. A flight would be in just a few hours and she was quite far away. Now we had the option to do something just ridiculous. To drive there by bike for 20-30 minutes in this blustering rain. 
to get completely wet and just see her again. It was ridiculous. Or we could go in our comfortable, nice beds and maybe see her one day again. But this was a decision and we decided to go for the story we would remember. And even though we were completely wet afterwards, it was quite fun and we had a nice talk on the way. And it ended up as one of my favorite memories in Taiwan. Just driving through Taipei at 3 a.m. in the morning, it being completely empty, the rain and the neon lights everywhere. It was beautiful. In my case, you already know that I started a YouTube channel in Taiwan. And because of that, obviously started taking videos and cutting videos of the entire time there. But you can also do it in a different form. For example, you can just take photos and put them into some kind of an album. Or you can write something, like a diary. Or because we are designers, you can have a sketchbook where you can scribble in all of your experiences. I think this is a very crucial step and maybe one of the most important things I would say to do there. Not because of one, but because of many reasons. I just hated it when people were constantly taking photos of their food, of people sitting together, taking group selfies. In my mind, it was just ruining the memory because it was interfering with doing the actual thing or living in the moment because you were already thinking about sharing it or looking at it later. But that mindset was, I think, around about two years ago. And nowadays, I think a little bit different. And if you think like I did back then, just hear me out. Maybe you notice that sometimes, that you can just not remember something as well as you think you can. Or you don't remember moments at all, because they need some kind of trigger to get you there. And seeing some kind of thing from that moment, or hearing a song, or seeing a picture, is what triggers that memory and allows you to come back to that moment. It is still there, but you can't access it, except when you have that kind of key. So nowadays, I think it is quite important to make those keys and make them regularly. But there's also many other benefits to that. One of them, obviously, very big for us as design students, because we do portfolios, and they are one of the most important things to do for us because we can do the most amazing work. If we are not able to present it or share it with other people, it is basically worthless except for the experience. Uh, we can't communicate that experience as well, so it is a problem. But documenting your time there and journey and projects, all of that just allows you to share it, put it in a portfolio, put it in a presentation. Remember the cultural differences and observations you made in that country and be able to share it. You don't have to search up a photo of something that you found in your exchange country and you want to use it in your ideation, for example, on a project way later on. But you already have it. You took it. You can just put it in there. And that way you maybe even circumvent costs and copyright issues. But it is even amazing for your university and your partner university. Because after we exchange, you also want to write a report and share how your time there was. To maybe convince other students to go there as well. And you can do that in writing, obviously. But a picture says a thousand words and a video a thousand pictures. So if you have nice pictures and videos of your time there, you can just share it and it will be much more impactful. And there is one easy way to make sure to make the most out of the time there. To be transparent with you, I didn't do this. At least not to the extent I would do it now or suggest you to do it. And that is something made out of two parts. One part is to write down why you want to do the exchange and what to get out of there. The time of an exchange is terribly exciting and there are so many things happening all the time that it is way too easy to forget why you actually started do it or want to do it in the beginning. And you don't want to have any regrets. This is something I did in the beginning, but also something, but also something I didn't completely follow. Because the initial plan of my exchange was to learn about Kansai engineering. It was one of the reasons I went there. I read about their Kansai engineering department and wanted to learn more about that philosophy and design. So I put that as a pretty big thing on my list. And even though I kept in mind that this was one of the initial reasons to go there, I consciously did not focus on it later on. Because at that time, for me, I found a more important thing to focus on there. Something that would be more beneficial. And I hope that worked out, because that is also a big problem. On exchange, you are changing. You go out as not the same person you came in there. But also because there are different circumstances during your exchange, you're also not the same person there 
as you are, let's say, coming back. So some perspectives might be different and maybe it would have been a better idea to stick to the original plan. But even though I didn't follow everything I wrote down to a T, I recommend you to at least try that exercise. And a lot of the time gives you half the way to go there. But now also for the other thing. And that is a list of the things you want to do there, the locations to visit and all those kind of things. We didn't do this officially in the beginning of our semester, but I could recommend to do, let's say, a Google document with all of your newfound friends there to write in the locations that you maybe want to go to, or basically like a bucket list for the things to do there. In Taiwan, that might be, for example, to go to KTV, to Taipei, to climb the mountains and visit the nature parks, attend a tea ceremony. I don't know, like there are so many things you could write on that list. But I mean, those are your priorities and things you would like. But you can also just use this to collect ideas. And you will probably not be able to do all of them. But if you do a couple of them, or honestly just to have a list, because if you don't know what to do, you can just go on there, pick something and do it. And there's always something to do. And that is quite nice. It helps immensely with not wasting your dead time. I hope your ears are not dying right now, because I'm back in Kiel and the wind is quite strong right now. But like my audio problems, you will also probably encounter a lot of problems in your exchange. So let's go over a couple of them and maybe you can profit a little bit from the experiences I had there and how I solve my problems. I think by far the most common one is to weigh out between a social event and schoolwork. And there's no real answer to it, you have to decide on your own. But just my thoughts on the matter. If you don't get credits, it's obviously much easier to just blow it up. But if you do get credits, it's a tiny bit harder. First off, let's see if it is a one-time social event or a one-time deadline. Because if you were missing just normal homework for the birthday party of a friend, it is obvious, right? Or your final exam just for night drinking, also very obvious. So you are probably not asking yourself that in those kind of situations, but of ones where it is a very similar weight. And what helped me in that kind of situation where it was very even was to just ask myself, what would be a bigger problem for myself that I missed it in, let's say, one year? If missing this exam means that I have to study half the year longer, I maybe don't want to do that. But if it means to get a worse grade, for spending your time on something you remember for the next couple of years. And for example, a trip where you would be angry with yourself later on that you didn't go there. I think it's obvious. This decision process helped me quite a lot, not only with school against social stuff. Sometimes I really wanted to go to my friends and just hang out with them, but I had to finish a video and I made that commitment to myself to publish regularly. And I know it's not always working out, but I'm trying my best and I'm really working on becoming more and more consistent in this. Just give me a little bit more time and I hope I can figure it out. But it also becomes a different story if it's not only time, but also money. What is if you want to go to that trip, but it is very expensive and you don't know if you can afford it? This is a super broad and complicated topic. And obviously none of this is financial advice. But in general, also the two things. One, really spend money. I spent way more money than I was comfortable to in Taiwan. But why did I do this? Because it was basically a one-time opportunity. I think a lot of the time, the money we spend on these one-time experiences is more well spent there than on anything else. It is really scary. Just believe me, I felt so uncomfortable spending so much money and seeing my bank account getting constantly drained. But with the absolute majority of it, I'm so happy to have spent that kind of money. But then there's also number two, basically the same as before. So if in one year, it would make a considerable difference in your life, either positively or negatively, decide based on that. If you won't be able to financially recover from it, or it will be so expensive that you will have to cut down the next year or so, or a trip that might have the potential to not be as good as imagined, don't make yourself vulnerable or put yourself at risk like that. It really is the boring thing to say, but stay safe and do those things responsibly. While also being a little bit irresponsible at times. <laughs> that is at least what worked for me. 
and I hope it works for you as well. If you go to a country and you don't speak the language of it, that obviously comes with a lot of problems attached to it. Luckily, you can solve a lot of them very easily, at least if it's possible to have constant internet access on your phone. Because by, for example, using Google Translate or other things, it makes it much more manageable to read house signs, documents, or the menu in a restaurant. And when interacting with people where you don't know each other's languages, a lot of the time you can just solve that by typing in something on your phone and translating it. Or using the pretty cool function in a lot of those apps that is pretty much able to translate voice instantly. So you can have some kind of conversation just via your phone. And even if you don't have those tools available right now with you, trust me, you will always find a way to communicate. Even if it is filled with a lot of problems, misunderstandings and a lot of hand gestures. Homesickness is something I can't really tell you as much about because I didn't have that much of a problem with it. Of course I missed everyone back home, but I don't know why I didn't have that problem just as much. Maybe it was because we spent so much quality time before leaving or because over the internet there was contact. I can only tell you that a couple of my friends had that problem and I too, but not my exchange semester, but on school trips. And what really helped me there is easier said than done but to just focus on the moments you spend there and embrace that instead of worrying about not being somewhere else in that point of time. And when trying to work as much as possible and do as much as possible with your friends there, make new exciting memories and experiences, I at least hope that the homesickness will slowly be not as strong anymore. And I'm always talking about how amazing your exchange semester will be. And honestly, I hope it will, but it is obviously not guaranteed. And before going to Taiwan, my exchange counselor just told me that if I want to come back, I always can. I don't have to feel pressured to stay there. Maybe there is conflict with the university or other very unforeseen problems. Maybe you don't feel very welcome there or it is just a all in all bad time. Don't feel forced to stay there. You can go back. You can just go back to your home university and everything will be like it used to. It is not like you are a failure or anything. Just do what is best for you. That is honestly the most important thing here because you are the one that wanted to go on an exchange semester just for you because it is the thing for you. And it doesn't make sense to stay there if it hurts you or is any kind of bad for you. In those cases, just come back. And when speaking about wanting to go back, one of the main causes for that is just being lonely or at least feeling lonely there. And that can have so many possible reasons. And in the beginning, when coming to Taiwan, I also felt extremely lonely and isolated for at least the first couple of days. It makes a lot of sense. Because let's say you moved in a new city in your country, you also will feel isolated in some kind of way. But it's not only that, but you moved to a new city in a new country, possibly with people not speaking your same language, having a completely different culture and you having no idea what is going on. So if you feel lonely in the beginning, maybe don't worry about it too much because it will go away as soon as you adapt a little bit more to the culture and country. But if it stays like that, that obviously is a problem. But something you can do against it is obviously to meet people. Easier said than done, you say, because even if you are at home, it can be quite hard to make new friends. But honestly, on the exchange itself, at least for me, it was much easier. Because obviously, depending on the country and where you are going and what you are doing there, people will be much more welcoming to you. You are the exchange student. You have always something to tell about. You always have a conversation starter. Where are you from? What are you doing here? And those kind of things. And you are exciting. <laughs> so a lot of the time people will just come to you and ask who you are and what you're doing here and want to go for lunch. And then you just have to say yes. Or you can also initiate it because sometimes people are shy. But if you initiate it, they are happy to talk to you. But other things you can also do is, for example, go to clubs of your university. If you have some kind of group activity, it is so much easier to make new friends. For example, a choir or pottery class. And being surrounded by other people might make it much easier to not feel lonely. This could be even louder now. <laughs> We are at the harbor here at Kiel. But I just quickly wanted to talk to you about something, which is basically just what to do in your time there while you are there before leaving. First, just be sure to have a great time and make the best of it. Meet a lot of great friends and spend time with them. Go over your list of things to do and 
cross them off. It is okay if you don't do all those things, if you don't explore all the things you wanted to explore, but explore everything you have to explore or what you would be mad about if you didn't explore it because it is not unlikely that you won't be in this country for quite a bit or maybe it even is a once in a lifetime opportunity so many things i i wanted to go and i just say oh maybe i can do this next week or next month or i still have some time so i kept on postpone everything i should do uh to to travel and at some point I just had no time left to travel. So that that's one tip. Something I would say to, to people is don't waste your time because even if you have a lot of time, uh, uh, time flies. <laughs> So don't waste that one and just explore, explore, explore. Every week there can be super exciting, so try to make the best of it. And even though it is unfortunate, this amazing time has to end someday. And maybe this day is now. So let's talk about what to do in your last days and weeks there. The first thing, obviously, is just to say goodbye to all of your friends. I think it's also the most important thing because it might take quite a while until you see them again. And spending that time having a good end or good memories to come back to is super important. So make some kind of celebration, a goodbye or farewell party. In our case, for example, at the time when everyone was leaving, basically at the same time after the semester was ending, we threw a big farewell party and it was really, really nice. Something like that will also make it a little bit easier to depart from each other because it's quite hard, at least in my opinion. And it was so sad for me to depart from everyone because you are finding so good friends there and then you have to say goodbye. It is obvious since the beginning, but when the moment comes, it's quite sad. But you not only have to think about the people you are leaving, but also coming back to. So if you haven't already, try to get some souvenirs. And obviously you can go to the touristy souvenir shops or that, but it might be a little bit nicer if you find something that has some kind of meaningful connection to you, your time there, or might be a little bit more interesting than the classical souvenir from that country or region. I think food is the best souvenir and just to protect your skin, try to get all the required documents from your partner university for your home university. Because otherwise there might be a lot of problems with your credits and all the things maybe. Get everything ready for departure. So pack your stuff, clean out your dorm room and those things. And also plan your travel back and also your time back home. I, for example, didn't learn from book my flight ticket there way too late and booked my flight ticket back, also very late, but it didn't matter because the price was quite okay. But maybe keep an eye out for that and don't book it way too late. And also start planning what you want to do when coming back, because it's so much nicer when you come back and you already have some plans there. Like for example, a reunion with your friends or a birthday party. Try to make plans like that and it won't hurt as much coming back. But despite everything, it is a sad moment. And even though I don't really have any more tips for your flight back, I have for when you are back home. I already have a full video on the subject, so check that out for a deeper look into it. But this is basically what I'm thinking. First off, be prepared that it is much harder than you would have expected to be. And by this point, it's more than just a couple of days. So I should be well adjusted, but be back here. I don't know what exactly it is, but even being back home, I feel a little bit alienated here. And I heard about that from many other people that went on exchange beforehand. And also all of my friends that went back a little bit earlier than me. So the duration also matters because we were there for four months, we were in our tourist high and we are just there trying our best to have fun at the same time, you know, progress in our academics, so on and so forth. There are some aspects that really shines. And when you go back home and you don't see that aspect anymore shining, you start missing that place. And in, in my case, it was the friend group, the freedom, the city, the safety of the city, and the ample of opportunities I got to better myself. Coming back, there are some of our friends who used work as their coping mechanism. They got back, they just had their semesters going on, they continued working and they got set, I believe. But 
everyone's going through the same thing right now even in my case i tried working and tried to just get set into my home university's work schedule and so on but it doesn't work all the time it doesn't work for everyone so <laughs> right now i'm just trying to just discover different stuff i used to do theater and so on now i'm trying to do start making music i've been composing music for the last couple of days for a challenge and i'm hoping to get a ep done maybe in the end of march yeah that's has kept me distracted but at the same time it's not the easiest post uh, post exchange depression is a real thing i miss everything so much the weather uh, first because when i came back to france was middle of winter when i went back to france i just don't know how to go to the supermarket again <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what i want to eat because i was used to go to the restaurant i don't know how to plan my meals <laughs> when when it's like two in the morning or something and everything is closed and also on on sunday like everything is closed i when i came back to my city uh where i study uh was sunday and I, I i i needed basically everything just like even a paper for the toilets <laughs> and how, how can i get some everything is closed on sunday so i just say okay well i wait for tomorrow <laughs> i'm applying for ncku again <laughs> <laughs> what i want to go back okay so i'm not only missing taiwan but the entire exchange semester and exchange semester experience there. I think this way it makes way more sense. I might make a update in let's say three months or half a year with how that is going <laughs> and link it here or here or here. But until then I will just try to make the best of it. And there's a lot of good things about being back here. What helped me a lot so far was just seeing the friends and things I missed from here. It was so nice because the semester in my home university still ran. So I was able to be there for the closing party. And it was so nice to see everyone again. Something else you should definitely work on is doing all the documentation. Or more so, see what to do out of the documentation. In my case, for example, I took so many photos there and took so much video. And obviously put some of it into these YouTube videos. But I'm also working on some videos to share with all my friends from there to remember our escapades. And I also work on putting all those amazing new projects in the portfolio. And something I'm still working on because I try to get it right is basically the report for my international office and maybe even the documentation for my university's press department and social media. Because after this amazing experience, I obviously want as many people as possible to go there. And to go there, we obviously need to convince them. And what better way to convince them than showing how amazing the time was and showing all the pictures and videos of all of your friends having fun there. So yeah, I think that sounds like a plan right there. Definitely. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like these. And for more videos on the topic, click here. See you next time.